You are listening to The Exchange by Evolution, a melting pot of ideas and inspiration shared by some of the most successful tech leaders in Asia. I'm Sid and I help connect commercial talent with the best tech businesses in Asia and today I'm your host. We will be discussing the topic of hiring for your sales org and joining us are two senior leaders who have built and led successful sales teams across the region. First, we have Dylan Swa, Chief Revenue Officer of Xtremax, and next, we are joined by Desmond Chua, the Senior Vice President and Head of Sales at DataSite for APAC. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to this discussion. Quick disclaimer before we kick things off. Um, all thoughts and views spoken by any of the speakers or myself are that of the, each individual and not that of their company. So I think with that out of the way, let's kick things off, let's get started. Um, to allow our listeners to get a better idea of who you guys are, what you do, um, we'll just start off with a quick introduction. So I think Dylan, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role at x Um So I, I think you already introduced my name. So uh, my name is Dylan Swa, uh, Chief Revenue Officer for x Um I actually focus mainly on B2B enterprise sales, mainly in the IT sector. Uh, that's it. Um, I actually started my career as a technical guy, then did a mid-career switch to do sales. Um, and it's actually precisely that reason why I'm extremely passionate about sales. I, um, if you ask me quickly, you know, there's always the discussion about art and science or for sales. I, I do think it's both, but because of my background, I do feel that there's a lot of science involved. So, very passionate about sales, happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Perfect. Desmond? Great, thanks, C. Um, I'm Desmond, and as C just mentioned, I oversee data science business in the APEC region, and we are a leading SaaS technology company for the MA and capital markets industry. So, in essence, we support companies like private equity firms, corporate development and uh, the advisory community with the tools they need to succeed across the real life cycle. So pretty much, you know, like Dylan, um, I came from a different background. I came from a sales trading background. And, you know, after a period of transition, I decided to enter into the vendor side of things, which is really exciting. You know, you get to see deals structured as they are being done, especially here at DataSite. So I'm really excited to be joining this podcast. Um, and thanks again, Steve, for inviting us here. All right. So. Um, you know, the first question that I have for you guys is what would be some of the main qualities that you look for when you're hiring? Because I think in both of your roles, a key part of it is building out that sales team. Um, and that obviously involves hiring the right people, whether, you know, they're the junior guys, who are the SDRs or BDRs, and then the more senior ones, maybe the AEs or directors, right? Um, what are some of the main things that you look out for when you're interviewing or hiring? Uh, that's what you like to focus. Sure. So I think more or less in SaaS tech organizations, we look into quite similar attributes across board, which is you know the innovative, creative individual um, who have demonstrated tenacity, determination, and consistency you know, across the many different roles that they have held. Of course, they need to come equipped with uh, good technical knowledge as well. Uh, but increasingly, I think one of the key markers that I tend to look at it's how much research have they really done on our company and i think that's very important because i want to take a look into for instance through their own means and connections what have they done to get to know us to get to know our strengths uh, our key differentiators our mode perhaps our gaps and even to a certain point you know where are our next key growth markets and it's not so much about what they get right it's more about, you know, the length at which they will go to because it demonstrates two things to me. One, it's that, you know, how resourceful are they in terms of getting this information? How are they making use of their own connections to get to this, uh, to get to the data? And then secondly, it's also about the interest levels. You know, are they shopping around? <laughs> are they, you know, kind of just investing in our company and getting to know us. So, so this is uh, one of the key markers. Secondly, you know, the other aspect that I tend to look at is uh, their curiosity levels. Exactly how curious are they? Because I truly believe when you are innately curious, you bring your fun self to work. You know, yeah. every day you wake up, 
you dress up and you're getting you're getting yourself you're not dragging yourself out of it you're actually bringing your best self uh, to work because you're curious okay, what happened overnight in markets how is that going to impact my client and how is this going to impact my deal and you dive into all these things right so um yeah i think curiosity is the other fact the last but not least uh, i know this is quite cliche but <laughs> constantly looking at the teamwork and collaboration how do they collaborate with other people because in the line of m a or in the line of um, what we do, you know, the merger and acquisition market includes a lot of different moving parts. So take for instance, a target might be um, based out of Southeast Asia or in, in, in Indonesia, for instance, but the advices are based in Singapore. So we need to keep the lines of communication open between counterparts to ensure that we get, we derive the best information and insights about the deal and we surround the deal. So we have a saying at data site, which is like 50% of one, is better than 100% of zero, which essentially means that we rather share the best resources and ensure that we are keep up to date with all the developments of the different parts of the deal, rather than to withhold that information within self and think that we get 100%, because at the end of the day, we may get 100% of nothing. So those are you know kind of the three markets we look at. Okay, okay. Well, I must say I'm actually learning. I, I've got one question for you. Yeah. What, what percentage of the folks that come actually do research? Which is a great question. Uh, <laughs> I would say it's, it's increasingly, especially with the new gen, you see them doing that a lot more. And with the new gen, it's the Gen Z. Um, and I don't know it because the business schools are teaching these things, but increasingly you see that. So one of my kind of favorite uh, interview or one of my most memorable interview was when someone actually came here uh, with a deck in my corporate colors telling us where our strengths and our gaps are. Uh, it's not a SWOT analysis, but it was done in eight slides. And I was like, wow, I was quite blown away. Um, yeah, we we unfortunately did not hire the candidate because he was shopping around. <laughs> but we did not manage to hire him. But I'll was, I was, I was say that he came very well equipped. Yeah. Wow, yeah. That, that is impressive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. Um, so actually, I guess when I, think, when I think about the qualities, right, I actually kind of try to simplify it for myself to remember and I call it um, art, as in, you know, like a piece of art, like a painting, right, a piece of art, so A-R-T. So the things that, um, the qualities that I really look for in this A-R-T is really A stands for accountability, uh, and then I've got R for resourcefulness, and then T for teamwork, and um, and let me let me kind of break it down, right, I, I found that in trying to work with various sales folks, um, accountability is something that really makes things move a lot faster and smoother. And the, th and the reason why this is so important is, actually, I'm not very interested in micromanaging folks when I run a sales team or I run my other kind of teams, right? So it is very important that when I work with the guys, whatever we all agree to, we all kind of get it done. And the thing about it that makes relationships work in the sense is that it's not just their commitment to get things done, but it has to come two way from me as well, which means that whatever I've kind of promised them, or whatever I say I'm going to do, say, okay, look, I will look into this matter, I will meet the executive, or I'll reach out to this executive and I'll co-call the person, right? Whatever I've said I will do, I will do. And this makes things a lot easier because trust is constantly being built, right? So, so uh, accountability is one of the things that I look for in sales folks. Now, the other quality that I look for is resourcefulness. Uh, and this becomes a very important thing because what I found really ties a lot of very successful sales folks together is the fact that how hungry and how much drive do they have to want to succeed. Now, but this resourcefulness right, actually has a bit of two elements inside. It's not just the drive to succeed, but the other thing, right, which is a little bit harder to kind of evaluate is the amount of intelligence that they possess to combine their hunger tie it together with intelligence so that they can solve their own problems and get to their own success. So resourcefulness is, is another important part. Um, and for the last bit, it's really about teamwork. And now this, this sounds like something a lot of people will commonly say, but I found this to be extremely important. Um, to the point that I would even say that I would rather hire an above average sales guy who can work in the team than get a top dog who just does stuff for himself but cannot fit in with everybody else. 
And the, 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 the logic behind that is, it's just that I'm trying to create a team where one plus one is not equal to two. I want a one plus one equals to three kind of formula. And that's why teamwork is extremely key. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest challenges that you guys might face is, you know, how do you assess for these in an interview? Just speaking to someone, right? So what would be, I guess, you know, your favorite interview question then? that you think would actually suss out a really outstanding candidate from one that will not be a good fit for you? Yeah, I think some of the questions that I typically ask, you know, surrounding teamwork, you know, could you tell me about a project that you've worked on recently where, you know, it's, it's a, a team project? Or can you tell me about the initiative that you have driven, you know, that involve a wider team? Things like, things like this, I mean, more qualitative questions. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to find out about how they uh, address a difficult situation. So one of these things that I often talk about is, you know, could you tell me a bit more about a you know, really difficult situation you've been put in during uh, in, in one of your projects or perhaps due to a work task? And I think it's what we want to kind of derive from it is the tenacity. You know, what did they do to actually resolve these issues, right? And Typically, it gives us a good idea of what kind of a person, because if he states the problem without actually telling me what the end state is, then you kind of know he leave, I mean, the, 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 the candidate will likely leave it as it is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think those are just kind of more of a qualitative questions that I tend to ask. Okay, great. Dylan, do you have anything to add for this? Um, yeah, I, I, I like him, by the way, I do like his questions. Um, I think the stuff that I ask in questions, I, I've got to give credit actually to Google because when I was there, they kind of coached us a lot about how to ask questions for what purpose, right? So I, I took, I, I took um, quite a few pages out of the, the, the Google interview questions. I think, look, there's a lot of stuff that I typically ask, but one of the things that I, I really care a lot for is kind of asking them when they try to construct a view. I try to understand who they have to work with, uh, usually asking for examples because then I, I'm not just trying to see whether they've worked with folks before, I also try to understand why did they start involving certain people. Uh, but beyond this, right, one of the things that I, I would quite likely ask a candidate right, is asking them right, that usually in a situation where they are working with a non-performer, it means they're trying to get towards a certain goal, they're working for, then they found out that there's a person who's not performing, usually a peer, right? And I'll ask them, right, how did they share the feedback with that person? Um, and this, this, this thing becomes very, very telling because when they explain their approach and they give the exact situation how they did it, right, we can kind of understand the kind of EQ that they possess, how they consider the situation while being very goal-focused. Uh, and I, I found that to be very, um, very insightful actually. Yeah. So th th that's at least one of the things that I do. I mean, I'm trying to, to understand. I'm stealing that. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So if I remember correctly, both of you guys, you know, lead regional teams. So could you share a little bit more about, I guess, how distributed the teams are and maybe the type of people that you manage in these different locations? Um, and then I'll follow up with another question as well. Sure. Um, right, I can go first. So, uh, yeah, I do have an APEC agreement which ranges from the southern end, which is Australia, all the way to the northern end, which is China, Japan. Seven markets in between. And, you know, to your question about basically hiring kind of priorities across the different regions, yes, there are going to be nuances. Like, for instance, in Japan, it's going to be a lot more uh, kind of hierarchical, seniority based, and, and in Australia, perhaps a bit more open uh, level. But I think more than just looking into region, I, more, something I wanted to address, and I don't know if Dylan you have also come across that, but in more recent times, what I've observed is the shifting demographics of the people that we are starting to hire, which is the Gen Z. As I mentioned earlier, people who are perhaps a bit more, um, you know, whether it's through their education institutionals or, or, or media, they're becoming a lot more, um, in that sense, street smart. 
where they would prepare really well. But one other aspiration I've seen apart from self-aspiration is they're looking into the social environmental impacts, you know, how they're going to deliver. I mean, how, how can they contribute to that? And they actually want to understand kind of our values. So, um, you know, interestingly, I, I, I interviewed a candidate, which typically is someone that I wouldn't interview, uh, but because I just felt that in her CV, it, it has a lot of very interesting um, and, and very different organizations, but they tend to be big organizations. And one of the reasons for joining those organizations because, and they're typically tech firms because they, they have a very light carbon footprint. Right. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting perspective. So I think with this generation, it's important for us to articulate how our values, you know, in terms of whether it's ESG are aligned and, and perhaps that would attract a, a wider talent. Secondly, it's um, when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion, which is another very big buzzword, and you hear that repeated many times. And I think I can relate in more recent times, like in one of my interviews that I conducted just three months back, one of the candidates actually asked, so you, your headquarters is in the US, you are APAC based company, uh, sorry, you are APAC, you are APAC based with, you know, footprint and APAC. So how are your views and uh, kind of your opinions being valued? And I was like, wow, that's a great question. Mm, I never really heard of that. And, and are your needs and kind of your localization needs being met? And just from the question, I could see the maturity of, you know, where this rep has been. It's probably in many different international organizations and perhaps been in environments where he may not have been hurt, right? So I thought it was really interesting that, you know, I think increasingly employees want to be hurt. They want to be engaged. And given international companies with satellite offices and maybe even contractors, yeah. you know, some of these people may feel like in the organizations that they've been, they have not been able to flag or bubble up issues. So I think one of the programs that we've instituted at DataSec, for instance, is a employee engagement survey. It's anonymous. So every year about, about now, about this time of the year, we will send out this uh, employee engagement survey to find out, you know, what do they feel and think about their direct superior? Um, what are kind of you know, how confident are they in the company and the direction that we're taking as, as well as the executive team. So you get to see kind of their feedback and they're both quantitative and qualitative. And so I think what's really good about this program is that we have extracted some of this feedback implemented in our policies and you see the engagement survey increase. So 2019, when we first instituted this, the engagement survey was 71. By the end of last year, it was uh, 84. So you kind of see this, you know, and in percentage terms clearly. So you kind of see a really high level of engagement. Secondly, um, the other thing that, you know, we want to look at is how do we drive innovation, especially in a tech company like ours. So again, to the point of diversity, right? I mean, so much research has shown that when you put people of diverse backgrounds of different disciplines and of different levels, when they come together and they're encouraged to collaborate, that's when innovation thrives. And so we conduct these product gems where we actually put whether, I mean, in COVID years, unfortunately, we have to do it virtually. But in more recent years, we managed to put this kind of people of different varying levels and backgrounds together, fly them out to, you know, somewhere and have them really go through a two, three day product gem. And that's when, you know, we develop really great products because you get to really absorb kind of the emerging trends as well as all the developments in those different countries and, and all parts of the world. Sorry, it's a long answer. But... <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask you to, again to ask the question because I, I, yeah. I just want to be sure that I'm answering it. Right. Sure. So, what are, I guess, some of, what's your original remit? And I guess, what would be some of the challenges that you have maybe hiring in those, um, in, in those countries? Okay. So, for me, I, I uh, in my current capacity, um, I'm actually covering ASEAN, uh, with the major focus markets being obviously starting from Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. But we, we do we do we do do business in other countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, and I've also helped with trying to grow the Australian office as well. So 
I mean, the, the remit can be pretty wide, but then right now the focus markets are, you know, in these three you know, Southeast Asian countries. Um, one of the things that I have been a bit surprised at is, despite the fact that I've been in so many uh, organizations uh, that have actually been pretty diverse, right, is that when I start interviewing in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, and one of the things that I realized that um, I must be quite careful about is a certain biasness where because a lot of things are about communication, but the thing about it is that English may not always be the, the, the first medium or the first choice of medium for, for them in communication, right? And how to get past the point to see all see through all this, number one in the interviews, and then second in the constant communication on day to day, right? Um, how to actually kind of take away the biasness that hey, this person may not be as articulate, but yet has some real value to offer. And to kind of see the kind of really see the true um, uh, the true capabilities that they bring to the table, I found that to be one of the most challenging things. Um, I, I don't really have a real solution to this, but what I found right is that by going back to understanding what kind of traits that we are kind of uh, judging and kind of valuing in each salesperson, also by some of the leading indicators we look at them right and giving them actually more time to articulate their thoughts, their challenges, I found that this becomes really, really key in making these kind of diverse teams from different nationalities kind of gel together better. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, now the second thing I found right, is that, and partially I think it's also down to the fact that we have COVID and things which kind of limit the kind of um, the ability to kind of get together. And I found that with some of the remote officers, right, it becomes a little bit more difficult to try to include them because a, a lot of it surrounds the head office. So then, because of that, right, there's, there needs to be a very conscious effort to reach out to them, visit them in the other countries, spend a little more time uh, with the reps, with the other staff in those countries to make them feel like they're part of this whole team that's going to try to achieve the success together. So really, I think managing the regional staff is really about getting past the, the way we communicate as well as how do we envelope them into part of the same team despite the fact that they're they not here with us in the same office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very same challenges that we face. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what is one unpopular opinion that you guys have on what would make a very good salesperson or sales leader? Um, anyone can go first. Yeah. Didn't want to want me to go by. Yeah. Um, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Yeah. So that there are, I, I guess, one of these things, and I, I think Dylan alluded to this. And although I think you mentioned the thing top dog, and I, I kind of mm. agree where that was driving it, which is you know contrary to kind of conventional stereotypes where the top that the top dog tends to have traits of, you know, being very dominant, demonstrate alpha profile, being pushy, uh, egoistical. What's interesting, I think, is that increasingly, and this is backed by the Harvard Business Review survey, is that 91% of leaders that has been sales leaders, uh, sales people that have been surveyed, tend to demonstrate very high levels or medium to high levels of modesty and humility. And I think it's easy to understand why, because at the end of the day, as consumers or even you know, as buyers, we want to buy from people that is relatable, grounded, and people that we like. Yep. Yeah. So it's quite contrary to what we think as the top dog theory, but rather you know people who want to collaborate, people who want to work together, and tend to kind of demonstrate traits of modesty at its point. Secondly, in the same survey, we didn't sponsor the survey, by the way. <laughs> yeah, but I saw this survey just, um, I think, half months back. That <clears throat> it shows that there's a very high level of something I mentioned earlier, which is curiosity. And why is because, again, there's a hunger for knowledge and information that's constant upgrading. So what you find amongst top salespeople, again, contrary to popular belief, it's not so much of them actually pitching. It's about them discovering. It's about them asking questions. So your top salespeople will likely be people who are asking a lot of questions, getting to know their clients, diving into very deep discovery before pitching. Pitching is kind of the last thing. We don't want a kind 
kind of, you know, just the same pitch every time. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think those, those kind of summarize you know, my, my thoughts there. Makes sense. I actually really love uh, what was mentioned about curiosity because I, uh, and how you actually kind of link it to the fact that they are, it kind of feeds a constant improvement as well. Mm. Um, and I, I just want to add on top of that, right? Because this whole, this whole um, attribute of being curious, it doesn't just add value to the own salesperson, but I think it also adds a lot of value to the customer. Because I, I feel as if these breed of sales folks, right, when they're very curious with their customers, right, they'll be thinking about what the customer has said. And often I've seen some of the most excellent salesperson that possesses this trait, right? After what they pause and ask the customer, I say, I, I don't get it. This, um, this thing versus what you said just now doesn't seem to tie up yeah. together. And they just uncover amazing gems. And, and really, sometimes when I watch some of these sales folks, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's better than a good movie, right? Just because how inspirational the whole moment is. Yeah. Yeah. So I absolutely uh, agree on that. Yeah. Okay, so I think this is kind of alludes to my next question, which is I think the most important skill that you think a salesperson should have or hone um, to be a great salesperson, right? Um, what would you say that is for you? If you had to pick one? Had to pick one. I think, oh, that's a... I think, in, in my point of view, um, as we, I, I mean, we've alluded that earlier as well, it's being curious and collaborative would be kind of my two big traits to go to. Um, I mean, Dylan mentioned accountability as well, which is something that, you know, I think every good salesperson should hold themselves to a higher level. Yeah. But if I need to kind of discover, then those are kind of the traits that I want to find out, which is, you know, how curious are they and, and how collaborative are they? I think when it comes to one quality, even surprisingly, I mean, it's, it's, it isn't in my in the three qualities I mentioned before. Right? But if if somebody has to hone something, I think curiosity will be my my, my my choice as well. And the main reason for this is because, um, but it, it it is something you can train, right? Being yeah. just asking the right questions about yourself, about the skills you possess, about the knowledge you possess, and then most importantly about the customer. I think this is something that one can train, which is why that, if it, you know, like if you're talking about something which is, you can hone, right? Which means that something you can yeah. sharpen, it definitely has to be this. Um, it does, I must say, it does require a fair amount of intelligence at the same time, because you can ask all the questions, but if you don't have the ability to process it and kind of pack it in, in buckets and kind of do the linkage for yourself, your customer, uh, it's a bit difficult as well, but it's true to true is very important trait to have. Right. Yeah. So in that case, right, what tips would you have to help someone who knows how to ask questions but doesn't know how to piece the puzzle together? How would you help that person? <laughs> they tried and tested and it's always a lot of rehearsals. You know, um, we go through a lot of accreditation processes <laughs> and it's it's more Every single one of our accreditation process is real time. So we see something that happens in the market, we apply it. Imagine we're a client, this is the scenario, go read the news. And this is, we kind of, I, I won't call it role play, because role play feels very cliche, but we really imagine and simulate that today, this client is going to call you up because this news is announced, this deal is happening, we're going to ask you for a proposal. How are you going to deal with it? Well, the untrained, sales executive would be like, oh yeah, um, how long is the process going to be like? And tell me a bit more and, you know, they stop there and then they send a proposal. But really, I think we want to dive into, tell me a bit more about the deal. Can you, can, can I find out if the client has any experience in using, you know, any form of these platforms? What is going to be key? What's going to be important for you? And what are some of the pain points you've faced running such a process in the, in, in, in the last time? I think really, trying to establish what is their, what is going to complete and make the deal successful and also what are some of the pain points that they have 
experienced before and they don't want to do it again. They don't want to have to experience all that pain. So that's where, you know, I feel like a really experienced, someone who has been through an accreditation process, been through a really thorough um, exercise, they would be, you know, they would basically go through the baptism of fire <laughs> to really understand the right questions to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, actually, the, okay. What, what I found is sometimes some of the sales folks that I work with are actually somewhat needs a certain kind of a easy to understand pattern where by just using a pattern to get better and better at applying it for the customer. And, and so this is kind of partially linked to being curious, asking the customer stuff, right? And I actually created uh, a sales methodology together with a colleague of mine before. But one of the things that I help them with is that I use this acronym which stands for uh, stands for gossip. But it's G-O-S-I-P. Okay, so G-O actually stands for the goals and the customer's goals. Uh, so we've got goals and then S stands for uh, the strategy. I stands for the issues. And then P is the products or the processes that they have, the customer has. So what I do is that I kind of run through a, a discovery methodology where you're not asking fixed questions, but you're asking questions that are around these topics about what are the customer's goals? What are the customer's strategies to achieve those goals? What are the issues that prevent them from achieving those goals? And then kind of asking them, what are the products, what are the processes that you have put in place that, be, that you're trying to uh, you know, put this in place to achieve those goals? So, I kind of give them a certain pattern of questions, like topics to ask, right? And the reason why I, I do this is that, especially when it comes to goals, I find that when you're dealing with commercial customers, typically when you invest in something, when you buy something, right, they are usually buying it because they're either trying to make more money for the company or they're trying to cut costs. So with these two things in mind, right, if you can't tie the investment of what you're trying to do to how it makes more money, or how it cuts costs, right? Then one thing I always ask the guys is like, so why would they invest money? Yeah, there are some other reasons why people would invest money, like you know, their own personal promotion and stuff. I'm just trying, always trying to help them point back to this thing. Is there a reason why they're investing? Um, and 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 so to me, right? This this is part of the way of me helping the customer, no, not customer, but salesperson, draw lines to link concepts together, mm. and then make sure that they understand that when you do something, it has to be for the better of the customer and are there lines that tie it to being better for the customer? And that's how I kind of got into it. Yeah, and I, I think to add to that point, it's really trying to through the process, get to understand it and tie it all back to the personal and professional motives of the yeah. client, right? And if we can get to that, you know, it unlocks kind of the key to the, you know, whatever you're trying to get to because it, it just, it's trying to be empathetic with their emotions as well. And once you understand that, you know, it unlocks the key and the floodgates, you know, you can you can do whatever you want to ensure that the client gets on board. Okay. <clears throat> so I think we've come down to our final question. I think this is a fun one. Um, sales 20 years ago is not the same as sales today. So how do you see it evolving, you know, over the next five to ten years? Um, yeah, I, I think one thing that we have all seen and, and it's very clear these days, it's, it's given the technologies out there, you know, with AI, chat GPT, um, and all these other AI tools out there, it's actually very fast to take a product to market. You know, you could literally get chat GPT, you know, give me a pitch for this type of product in this kind of industry give me examples and you could come up with something decent you know so i think taking something to market is easy but having the skill of execution um i think that that's where the difficulty lies you know so you see a lot of companies and, and increasingly a lot of startups that um they have something innovative they can go out there very quickly but just trying to maintain that momentum it's not as easy so i think setting up foundations which is you know um like methodologies as dylan has mentioned along with uh a great product development plan 
in terms of and being very agile, you know, being able to kind of switch uh, rather than build on monolithic platforms, you're know, building it on microservices to ensure that you know a lot of this uh, kind of features and, and, and applications can be switched to address something new or emerging trends. I think that that's going to be quite key because things are moving so quickly that you know I, I mean. We just need to keep up to all the latest tech, be very aware of the changing trends, you know, whether you conduct internal or external surveys, and then being able to very quickly adjust and adapt to that um, and, and not be afraid to kind of innovate. Yeah, this would be kind of where I think sales is going to be. <laughs> okay, okay I, I'm going to address this question uh, in two parts, right? Uh, but Definitely, the focus is going to be on, on enterprise sales, where you know, like it's a fair amount of time that you need to to uh, to invest in to kind of close the deal with the customer. When when I think about sales in the past, when I read some of the very old sales books, where you know, like it's it's very targeted, where knowledge was actually scarce, so that means the consumers don't really know about the stuff they want to buy. So the salespeople in the past actually needs to be the product expert, kind of doing the education, talk a lot educate the customer about what they're selling, uh, which could be to a totally new domain for the customer, right? And then kind of get them across the line by just kind of showing the merits of it. And they probably got to spend a lot of time talking. And one of the common things they used to teach was, you know, how do you do project hand uh, objection handling, mm. right? How do, you, how do you pitch the right way? How do you build trust and stuff? And then I think we saw another evolution. Uh, we saw an evolution of how sales change where like people start talking about solution selling, so you, you spend a little bit more time um, listening before you start uh, proposing uh, solutions. But then, even during those times, right, um, you still need to possess a fair amount of knowledge about your own product uh, because customers still don't really know too much about it, right? But anyway, as 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 the internet, the pervasiveness grew and now it's, it's it's everywhere, right? The consumers know more and more about stuff before even before they approach you, right? And what I found that the salespeople, in order to continue to add value, right, I find that the evolution of the requirements has now changed in such a way that the salesperson now needs to be a kind of jack of all trades. They they need to be extremely well read. They need to be problem solvers, uh, and not only that. On top of that, right, they need to ask questions and be be able to pivot very quickly so that they can adapt themselves to what the customer really needs and then after that right coming back into this in our current world right because again things have changed so much right they, they may not really always need to be the expert in their staff but they really need to be able to leverage because there's so many people that know so many different parts right and piece together something that they now package for the customer so there's a lot of i i, I do find that it requires a lot of um, um, a lot of being curious about things, that's how you keep yourself well read. It also requires a lot of high EQ, which means that you can interact with the customer, plus also interact with your team so you know who to leverage and how to leverage them. So I think th this is how sales is kind of evolving and that's what's going to be required of salespeople going forward. Now, the next one is a little bit, probably a little bit shocking, but there's always this little part of me that sometimes looks at how advanced AI is actually uh, how, how advanced AI is, right? And sometimes at the back of my mind, right, I do wonder whether AI can possibly replace a salesperson. Now imagine one day, right, where um, machine learning is so well trained about the, the, the company's own products. Will it ever come to the point that one day you can train them to answer a customer's questions and the customer truly know, right, that your, your, learn, your machine learning algorithm can be trusted and then they will just rely on them asking their questions, pair up with their research, right? And then they never have to worry whether this salesperson, do they have another motive? And just say, you know what? I'm just going to trust the interaction with this machine learning, this AI algorithm. So there's a little part of me that wonders whether it will evolve ever to a stage where they just go, you know what? I'll trust the machine because there's a higher chance it's a bit more truthful than a person. I really hope that day doesn't come. <laughs> I, 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 I won't go through all this, but I've got I'm other reasons why people are still required. But there's still this little part of me that wonders whether that day will come. Yeah, as with all AI, there's moral hazard in the AI as well, because they learn both the good and the bad. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully that day never comes. And I think, you know, to Dylan's point, I really like that point about leverage. Uh, and, and about, again, you know, ensuring that you're able to collaborate because, yeah, as, as he has mentioned, you're not, never going to be as good as all the heads put together. So, yeah, that's an excellent point. Right. Fantastic. That's all the time we have today. So thank you to both Dylan and Desmond for joining us and sharing your knowledge with everyone. I think it has been really insightful and interesting. So stay tuned for more podcasts and we will see you next time.